Welcome back to the Move Podcast. We're going to take a look at the 2023 Vuelta España. And we got a little bit of a different lineup here today. I'm looking forward to this. And I know Johan's really looking forward to this Vuelta. But I'm JB Hager, joined by George Hincapi. And then, of course, Johan Bernil. Uh, Spencer is somewhere on vacation. He's off in the mountains on his bike, which is a good thing. And uh, Lance had some other business. But these guys know the Vuelta. They know this lineup. And uh, we're going to get into all of that with George and Johan in just a second. But first, I want to tell you about a couple of our partners. Today's show is brought to you by One Skin. In July, we started telling you about One Skin, this great product that uh, a team of scientists have created that can, can reverse the aging process of your skin. It's really amazing. They isolated, tested thousand or so peptides and then isolated one that that does the job. So I use this daily and I've noticed a difference. I know I'm not the prettiest guy if you're watching this on YouTube, but every bit, a little bit helps. So I use that every day. And then I also use this. I don't know if I've ever mentioned this one to you before, but this is the, uh, the uh, one skin eye supplement right here, which I put under these baggy eyes of mine. And it really helps it quite a bit. I know, again, if you're watching, you're probably like, JB, you still have bags under your eyes, but you should have seen it before. It's a remarkable difference. My wife has noticed the difference and has actually started using the product as well. So One Skin is for everyone that wants to prevent or reverse the signs of aging with a groundbreaking approach. The One, One Skin addresses skin health at a molecular level, targeting the root causes of aging so skin behaves, feels, and appears younger. It's time for you to experience a new skin health routine at a discounted rate today. Get 15% off with the code the move at oneskin.co, not dot com, dot co, oneskin.co. That's 15% off at oneskin.co with the code the move. Today's show is also brought to you by Ketone IQ, made by HVMN. And I've got a couple of, for those of you watching on YouTube or, or uh, on uh, Facebook, I've got a couple of samples here in front of me. This is the bottle that I just keep in the fridge, do a daily shot. So you can see I'm down to the last one here. There's 10 shots in there total. And uh, and I love it. Whenever I go anywhere, I just grab a box of the little travel size ketone IQ right there and just uh, throw them in my bag. Super, super easy. Once it becomes part of your daily uh, regime, you'll, you'll just you'll notice a difference, especially for me. And I've told you this before, have noticed a huge difference and just sustained energy throughout the day. I'm not drinking coffee like I used to, maybe a cup, and I'm doing fine, doing great. Like I used to have to be fueled by caffeine all day. Not anymore uh, since I started doing this just a little over three months ago. So you can save 30% off your first subscription order. And I recommend getting the subscription so you can set it and forget it. But uh, you can get your ketone IQ at hvmn.com slash the move. Again, visit hvmn.com slash the move and subscribe upon checkout for 30% off. All right, George, Johan, thanks for joining us here. And uh, we appreciate you coming on to tell our listeners your predictions for what's going to go down in this year's Vuelta. But first, let's start with an overview of the course. I'm sure, Johan, you've taken a really good look at it. What I know is it, uh, it's, it favors climbers, and we won't see a lot of big-name sprinters in this tour and you can break down that for us. Uh, let's start with you, Johan, including a team time trial too, which I know you guys. Yeah. Are yeah. It looks like the Vuelta is more and more. I mean, every year they're trying to find new little climbs, steep climbs. Um, and it's becoming a climber's course. Uh, often, I mean, if, if you look at this, this year's Vuelta, there's nine uphill finishes um, plus a time trial, plus a team time trial. So, and then some other, really hilly stages um i think particularly I mean, there's two really big 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 climbs that 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 stick out is the it's the angiru which is one of the steepest climbs in europe um well known by by most of the most of the riders i remember uh the first time the angiru was uh, in the vuelta was in 1999 and i remember that the mechanics after the stage before they were late night at work because we had to mount triple chain rings because back then we didn't have these gear ratios yet uh, that there's now. So that was uh, was a 32 in the front and then something like a 27, 28 in the back. Um, 
So Angiru, and then of course the the Tourmalet, uh, which is you know very very special for for the Vuelta finish on top. But particularly what I, what really sticks out to me is that stage three is already a decisive mountain uh, like a, G, a mountain stage and a GC stage. Uh, so from very early in the in the Tour of Spain, we're gonna know. Uh, and, and this is typical for the Tour of Spain. You can say, you know, we can look at the lineup and we can say, okay, great. I mean, all the stars are here, but in which condition do they really show up? In with which motivation do they show up? This is different than the Tour de France and the Giro. Is the, the Giro is the first Grand Tour of the season, so everybody's still fresh and motivated. So we're going to see already on stage three which of these big, big names is actually not going to win the Vuelta or is not ready or is not 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 capable of winning the Vuelta. Yeah, and no, let's not let's not forget a really technical start. I think I've only done the start of a Grand Tour, and, and Johan, correct me if I'm wrong, with the team time trial in the 2007 Giro d'Italia in Sardinia, right? Because normally we do the Tour de France two or three stages, and then we get the team time trial, which for me is the most intense, technical, uh, most dangerous event you can do in the sport of cycling. It's just, there's no margin for error. You're going at 60 kilometers an hour, millimeters from the uh, nine, eight of your teammates now. Um, so I, I'm particularly excited about watching the team time trial in an iconic city like Barcelona. Um, clear, clearly, Yumbo is going to be the favorites, but I think UAE and uh, Ineos will put up a big battle as well. But I'm, I'm very excited about that first stage. I'm, I, I got to ask you, George, more, more to expand on that, because do you think because they're starting stage one team time trial, you're, you're not really settled in, makes it more likely to for us to see errors? Is that what you're well, suggesting? That's, Absolutely, because some guys are, are more settled in than others. Some guys are ready to race. They have their race legs. They're ready to go. Some guys are just hoping they can work their way into the, the Welta, which you can't work your way into a team time trial. Um, in fact, back in our day, we had certain guys like myself, we'd, we'd take as long a pull as we could, and some guys weren't even allowed to go on the front. They'd be like, you just hang on for dear life because we need you. We can't drop you right away, so don't take any pulls. Unless you make it towards the last half of the race, then you can start pulling. But as soon as you pull, get off the front right away. I mean, some of the best climbers in the world, we wouldn't even let them pull in our team time trial. Mm -hmm. So um, now Yumbo is a different situation because their climbers happen to be very good time trials as well. But uh, we had a situation where we had good climbers, not great time trials, and we would do the best we could with that sort of uh, you know ensemble on the team. But it's just a very technical, you know, uh, intense, intense event. Yeah, I mean, starting with a team time trial, short team time trial, like this 15 kilometers, it, you know, it's very stressful um, for the riders, for the mechanics, especially for the mechanics. This is, you know, nobody wants, I mean, nobody likes this. It's great to watch. It's not going to be of any particular decision in the final outcome of the, the Vuelta, because I think the, the differences are not going to be very big because it's a technical course also. Um but it's stressful, man. It's stressful. And if you come in, it's like George says, if you come into the wealth and say, okay, I'm just going to ride into it. Well, <laughs> that's, that's like with the blood until here, you, you taste blood all the time <laughs> after one, two kilometers. And uh, it's, it's, it's a very special, very special start. I think, you know, it's going to be very, very nice in Barcelona, but, but man, stage three already, you know, in Andorra there in Pal Arinsal, that uh, uphill finish, uh, two two climbs in in it's, it's a bit like the Tour de France. You know, the Tour de France started also with really very early the mountain stages, uh, and this is even earlier. This is a real, real, real mountain stage. The one in Andorra on stage three. Well, yeah, which could uh, really dictate a lot of um, what's going on within teams like Jumbo, the team dynamics, like who's going to be the leader. Um, so I, yeah, like like you said, Johan, then we got UAE with Ayuso and. On media, I mean, it's going to be a bunch of things that are already going to be decided. Not maybe not decided, but um, a lot of uh, questions will be answered on stage three already. Oh yeah, well yeah. I mean, you know, we have if, if we go over all those names, you know, like we can talk about them later. We we will already see. Okay, this guy, we think of him because he has a certain pedigree and a certain reputation as a Grand Tour rider, but he's he's not ready. You know, this is also typical. Of, was I mean I'm gonna say was typical of the Vuelta. Um, you see, you can see that things are really shifting because, you know, let's say Geraint Thomas or uh, Bernal or these guys don't come to the Vuelta just for fun. You know, they, it's because they want to perform. 
a long time ago, it was, you could say that half of the Peloton and the Vuelta was there because they had to be there. It's just because the team put them on the list, right? <laughs> I listened to an interview uh, today of Pavel Sivakov of Ineos, a guy who's leaving the team to UAE uh, after being six years on the team. And he was incredibly disappointed that he was in last instance of the team, didn't understand why. And uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's a, they're, not, they're not racing that much anymore these days, you know. And so whenever you have access to a, to a big race and the wealth, of course, it, and, and they, they have some opportunity to race for themselves and they don't make the team, they're disappointed. Before it would say, oh, you know, I don't have to go to the wealth. Thank God, you know. Right. Yeah, not, <laughs> not, not only are they not, not only are they not racing as much, but back in our day when we were we, we were not racing as much, we'd be home. Nowadays, they're at training camps at altitude, uh, and like I mentioned, Sivakov, he's at training camp for basically a month and a half, a month and a half away from home, at yeah. altitude with his teammates, doing everything right. And then, it's uh, you know, it's understandable with his uh, you know his disappointment not being selected for the for the welter team. Yeah. All right, let's go through team by team and the GC favorites. Let's start out with the big dogs trying to, and I, I believe we said this on a previous show, no team has ever won all three grand tours. Jumbo Visma has that goal. Uh, and they have Primoz Roglic and Jonas Vingago. So let's start with talking about that team and their dynamics, co-leaders, I'm guessing. But w which is more important for them? to uh, have Roglic get four Vueltas, which ties the record, or their, you know, their new star, Jonas Vingago, uh, winning this race. What's, which is better? You want to go first, George? <laughs> sure. I'll go first. Um, well, I'm very excited to see them race together because we've watched this season, or the last several seasons for that matter. I mean, Roglic has pretty much won every stage race he's done, except when he crashes. Um, except the Tour de France, obviously, when uh, Pogacar beat him in that time trial. So I feel like Rog Roglic is going in with a ton of motivation. He won the Giro. Um, he's got that explosive power, which I think we're going to break down some of the bonus, how important the bonifications are. And on the other hand, in my opinion, I could be totally wrong. Jonas is, the team will send Jonas there because he's probably got so many other obligations after winning the Tour de France, becoming a Danish superstar once again that they got to keep them focused. They got to keep them riding. They got to keep them away from all of these, um, these ass that are going through his, his inbox right now. He's probably being asked to go everywhere, being offered tons of money with the team's like, you know what, let's get into the wealth of keep him around his bike, build him a strong foundation for next year. And obviously he's going to come in with a lot of fitness, a lot of residual fitness from the Tour de France. He won the Tour de France by seven, eight, nine minutes. Um, so even on his, not his best form, he could still win the Welta. Mm -hmm. But it, I'm sort of leaning on favoring Roglic for this Welta and favoring Roglic to be the team leader. But of course, you can't can, never can out, count out a Tour de France winner. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see them work together. You know, to answer your question, Debbie, I think they don't. I mean, I, as a team, you you should not care who wins. Um, I think their main goal is to win all three Grand Tours. They don't care if Roglic would win four and ties the record. Um, I personally, I agree with you, George. Uh, for me, Roglic is the favorite. Um, it was on his radar since the beginning. He had an ideal preparation, was not bothered by anything this time. Um, and this is a course that favors him, especially with those steep finishes sometimes and the bonifications. Uh, the difference, the difference with with Vingegaard. I mean. I, I kind I kind of have to you know we we all we we thought okay we were surprised to see Vingegaard go to the Vuelta but then he said actually it was on the schedule since the winter already and he just announced it uh, after the tour so um, I think they're making a right a wise choice to send him to the Vuelta just because of all these other distractions and 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 you know uh, potential obligations uh, but Vingegaard is now coming into this race in a completely different mindset than he was before. Now he is the established leader in his mind though. So he's, he's thinking as a leader. Um, so it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see how they, how they work together. Uh, and, and honestly, I, I don't exclude. I think actually it's very possible that they're one and two in the, in, in the Vuelta. I mean, 
if you see this team, if you see those two riders and that lineup, I mean, being third is like, okay, that's like the best possible thing that I can get. You know, even for a guy like Remco who won last year, I think he could potentially, we, we don't know how he's going to perform against those guys, right? But he could potentially end up third, uh, being in better shape than last year and actually having a better performance, but not win. I can see well, this and, perfect, I can see this happening. And let's not forget, Johan, last year, obviously Remco won the Welta, but Roglic was coming on some crazy mm. form after halfway of the Welta and, and, and sort of starting to chip away at, uh, mm. at Remco's dominance, looking very good. And then he had that unfortunate crash um, after he did the, one of the most amazing uh, attacks I've seen in, in modern day cycling in a long time. Um, and he crashes. So I yeah. almost feel like, you know, there's, there's that with Roglic was, was, was just going to get better. He's going to continue to get better. He's, he's already won a couple of races right before this at Burgos. Um, so his form is as good or even better than ever. And his yeah. confidence is sky high after winning the Giro and everything he's done it, this year. And, and this year, this year, Roglic has not lost one single race. He has, he has done four races. He's done Tireno, won it. He's done two, Vuelta Catalunya, won it. He's done the Giro, <laughs> won it. And he's done the Tour of Burgos and won it. I mean, amazing. Uh, I, I think Roglic is such, such an underrated rider. You know I mean? Yeah. He's, of course, you know, we have Pogacar, we have uh, Remco, we have Mathieu van der Poel, we have Bonart. They're all a part of being amazing bike riders. They're also super flashy personalities, I would say. Van Aert, maybe not so much, but uh, Roglic is like, you know, I, I, I've, I've said it already in, in, in other podcasts. You know, he's the silent assassin, you know. Yeah. He is he's a guy who's working and then whenever he is ready, he just executes to perfection. Um so we'll we'll see. I mean, it's 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 a big responsibility also for it's it's kind of Jumbo Visma against the rest of the of the peloton. There's nobody else. I mean, even Ineos with a very strong team, they're going to say, you know, what well, we don't care. We we don't take responsibility of the race. Uh, so that responsibility is going to come really really early on. It's likely that Jumbo Visma wins the team time trial. And then it's even more likely that in stage three, they're already in a very strong position with both of their riders. So from then on, what's going to happen? You know, let's not forget. Teams are down to eight riders. Things can happen. They can lose a rider on a crowd. We hope not. But, you know, then all of a sudden you're down to five or four riders to work. So um, that's going to be the big the big uh, task for Jumbo Visma to keep this under control. Uh, where you see, where you will see that it's the the whole peloton against them. Yeah, and also the second stage too is already. I think it finishes on a one k like ten percent climb. So <laughs> it's already well, which with Sir Roglic on a good day, nobody's going to beat him on that. So we're we're we're, we're forgetting about we're forgetting about those. Uh, well, I think it's. I mean, it's uh, it's a Montjuic, so uh, it's in Montjuic yeah. the, the, the the second stage. There's a lot of these stages that you know if you look at them. You know, just just on uh, if you don't look in detail, you don't see those little little kicks at the end. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, on the one hand, they are in an amazing situation with with the quality they have, Jumbo Visma. Then on the other hand, uh, they have their work cut out to bring this uh, to a good end because they're, they, you know, they're they're. And also, I have the impression, George, I don't know what you think or if you know something about this, but, you know, the way they've been racing, and especially in the Tour, something tells me that they haven't made a lot of friends <laughs> uh, as a yeah. team, you know? So yeah. that always comes back at some point, you know? Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, they they definitely do whatever they want. They attack in Columbus Zero, put guys in the breakaways that, you know, like some of the best guys in the world, like Wild Men are. Um, so I'm sure for the other teams, that gets a bit annoying after a while. <laughs> so I could see some uh, collusion amongst the other squads for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And before we move on from Jumbo Visma, we should mention too that American Sepp Kuss is doing all three Grand Tours back to back to back. <laughs> I can't believe I, I, can, I can't believe this. Uh, you know, when when they were saying, "Yeah, you know, we'll see." First of all, I thought it was it was already. I personally thought he would do Giro and Vuelta, you know, because the way he has done the Giro and rode for Roglic, that man, he's not going to be recovered for the tour. He did, he was recovered, and now obviously he must be recovered again 
Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't put him in there. Uh, Sepp Kuss is incredible. I think he's unique uh, in 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 that aspect that he's there when he needs to be there. You know, he's one of yeah. those guys that they, they they probably say, okay, you know, here here are here are five stages set that you need to be there. Everything else we don't care, and he's able to do that. You know, he's able to sit back, lose time, doesn't care about the overall, and then. The days he had to, has to be there, he's just the best. You know, there's nobody even close. Imagine Sepp Kuss and then Roglic and Vingegaard, those three guys, man, on those, like on Tourmalet or, or on on uh, Angliru. I mean, who's going to stay yeah. with those guys? <laughs> yeah, George, I want your thoughts on Sepp Kuss, but I, I'm just going to add to it. Three Grand Tours in a row, and it's... It's not on just some team that's a non-factor. He's have had to work very, very hard on the most targeted team. It's not just cruising along. Yeah, I mean, one of one of America's greatest climbers that we've ever seen. Um, what what a foundation he has. What what in, what 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 endurance this kid has because to do three Grand Tours. I mean, for me, the most most Grand Tours I've ever done a season is like one and a half. So I've never done two. Never even imagined doing two. It's just it's 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 such a hard thing to do one Grand Tour. So um, it's just amazing what he's doing, and he's clearly focused it's, on that. Skipped the worlds and hasn't done anything except the Grand Tours in the last three months. So it's that also is a big different, George. It's different. It's different also nowadays. You know, I mean, obviously he was not uh, present in the in the spring classics. Yeah. Uh, you know, they race a lot less, but already, you know, if, listen, if you race three round tours, that's already 63 days of racing, you know, <laughs> uh, a lot of guys do 40, 45 days of racing, uh, these, these days. So yeah, yeah, it is, it is impressive to be able to, to do that, uh, and, and, and be there people. I think people really underestimate the amount of pressure there is on a rider like Sepkus on those specific days knowing that, you know, he has to be there at that moment because, and sometimes it's only for one kilometer or one and a half kilometer, but to be there that specific one and a half kilometer, the pressure he has and the nerves, I mean, it, it must be so stressful because you never know how your legs are going to respond until finally you get to the front and you have to kind of up it one, one, one kilometer per hour speed. That's, that's incredible. That, that, that tension. Well, not only that, not only that, he was he was there when those kilometers uh, that you speak of were needed of him. But he would also keep going and finish top ten in a lot of the mount, most of the mountain stages of the Tour de France, which is not anything that you and I are used to seeing, Johan. But this is a, a guy that's just a pure class, and you know it's so interesting to see how good he's gotten, and I'd love to see him see what he can do on his own one of these years, but. Um, for now, we, have, we probably won't see that for a while because he's so valuable to these guys that they will never let him go. Jumbo Visma will not let him go. It would be, it would have to be something really special. Uh, and and I think also that Sepkus, personally, I think that he, he, he really feels good in that role. Uh, you know, there's absolutely no guarantee that if he would ride for himself on another team that he would perform, you know, to what everybody would expect. Because it's it's you know having the pressure during the weeks leading up to a Grand Tour and then during the three weeks is completely different than you know having to be there those specific days. I agree with you one thousand percent. I mean that's one of the questions I get asked most. Like, didn't you ever want to go on your own? Well, one, I could never win the Tour de France on my own. Two, amongst your peers and the people that you work with, your teammates, the people you see day to day, you are as respected as the guys that's winning. Um, yeah. And he's probably making a ton of money as well. So why not? He's, he's in a happy position. He's the best in the world at what he knows he's good at. Um, so I agree with you on this. He's, uh, he's in a great position right now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's get into Remco Evenepoel looking to repeat from last year. Uh, the question mark is on his team, I'm guessing. Let's start with you, Johan. Uh yeah. What do you, what do you think? Uh, how will how will this fare for Rimco not having the team totally redesigned yet for Grand Tours? I personally think in this Vuelta, specifically in this Vuelta, I'm not that worried about that. Hmm. Um, he he yes he won this Vuelta last year, but he doesn't start as the favorite. He I'm pretty sure that Remco in his mind he thinks he's the favorite. I mean <laughs> that's the way these he thinks and and rightfully so. You know he has that kind of mentality. You know, but. 
they don't have to weigh, you know carry the weight of the of the race uh it's it's all on jumbo and in second in second position i, I would say it's it's uh ineos and in third position it's even uh uae so his team um if Remco needs to, needs to just do one thing, he, he needs to try to follow the best guys in the final of the stages, uh, and then try to get, gain some time in the time trial. So it's uh, it's a bit it's a bit strange to have to be you no know, be ex world championship, ex world champion on the road, defending champion, and, and not being the favorite, and and most likely most likely not going to win this Vuelta. Uh, unless he pulls something amazing out of the back, you know we have not seen him until now rivaling at the same level of these guys. Vingegaard, Pogacar is not here, but and, and and Roglic, right? Although in Catalonia he was kind of equal with him, but he was beaten by him. Um, so I, I think for Remco personally, it's it's a good test. It's a great test actually if he really wants to make the Tour de France from next year on his goal. Uh, he needs to be able to stay with those guys. Uh, for that, you don't necessarily need a complete team. I mean, as long as he has two or three riders with him uh, just before the last climb, it's fine. Even if he's alone on the last climb, he, he's only going to have... I can only see one potential scenario where Ramco would have a problem if he doesn't have the, the necessary team support. But even then, and that's when it's a huge selection and it's and then very likely to happen. It's Vingegaard. Roglic and Remco. Then he has a problem, but still, at that at that level, when Remco's on the limit, these other guys, although they are there, they're also on the limit. You know, the difference is very very small when everybody's on the limit. So, I'm not that worried um, about uh, about. I mean, he still has a strong team. It's not it's not that you know. I mean, let's not forget. You know, we we last year we talked about Quick Step, but they did support him and they did help him win the Volta. Uh, let's not forget that. You know, it takes it takes quality. They don't have the biggest names, but I, I think he's well surrounded. Uh, enough enough to to you know that the problem of course becomes when you take the let's say if after stage 10, which is the time trial, let's say he he would take the jersey. Then of course you you get into a position is my team strong enough? But even if you have the jersey if he has the jersey after stage 10, then still, I think still Roglic and Vingegaard remain the favorites. Yeah, I, I, to me, this is this is shaping up to be one of the most anticipated uh, Weltas de España that we've seen in a long time. Uh, one, because we're seeing these emergent stars. We're seeing past Tour de France winners. We're seeing past Giro winners. We're seeing Remco, which a lot of people question, but on Remco's day, there's... I mean, we've seen him at Lies Bastogne Lies, the World Championships last year, where he rides. I mean, rides away people, drops some of the best riders off of his wheel on flat roads. So what he has done leading up to this this Vuelta is as impressive, in my opinion, as all the other favorites. And yeah, let's not I forget, agree. he might he might have potentially won the Giro had he not gotten COVID. Um, so we don't know. That's the X factor. So for yeah. me, it's particularly exciting to see on a healthy. You know, mano a mano with Roglic, Vindigo, Remco. You know, maybe not Vindigo because he could be tired from the tour. He could be not tired. We'll see on that. But with a good Roglic, a good Remco, I don't know. I'm not sure who's better at this point. Mm. Obviously, the team, Yumbo's got a better team for sure. But I'm excited to see uh, Remco at his best. At the yeah, I mean, and, and uh, George, the perfor his performance in the World Championships time trial, you know, yes. beating... Beating Filippo Ghana, you know, one of, the, I mean, I would say the best time trialist in the world. He has the world, our record. Uh, you know, he has, you know, there's been a lot of, a lot of question marks on the professionalism of Quick Step, uh, Sudal Quick Step, you know, and their equipment. And, you know, he won the, the world championships against the best time trialist in the world with the best team around him on the best equipment with the best science around it. Uh, you know, I mean, it takes it takes a special guy to do that. And uh, the way yeah. he won the, the way he won San Sebastian again was also impressive. So um, the only thing that I'm a little bit worried about for Remco is, uh, but again, you know, I'm thinking old school. 
uh, when you know you would say, yeah, you know, he's too early in good shape because he's been going already since his return in San Sebastian. So he did San Sebastian, uh, was already in great shape, then did the Worlds, you know, won the, won the world. So it's he's already a month or more than a month on a super high level, and now he needs to do it another three weeks. Whereas Roglic came back, they skipped the Worlds, came back, Burgos, let's say with all with all respect, it's only the Tour of Burgos, so it kind of relaxed. Pingegaard didn't race at all. Um, so that could be a bit of a disadvantage that he's been going already, but then again, you know, he, he didn't race that much before that. Yeah, and I think it was it was all part of the plan. I mean, you saw right after the World Championships, he went back to altitude. I think he went home for a day or two, back to altitude. Um, so even though he was so dominant in the Welt and in the and then the World Championships TT, we saw he wasn't at his best at the at the road race, or that wasn't really his course. Um, wow. But but if you look at some of the comments, like for instance, Felipe Ogano, who's got the World Hour record, arguably the best time trial, it's the guy who can hold the most power than anybody in the peloton. Even he says, I don't think I can ever push more watts than I did in this World Championship TT. Maybe I can get more aerodynamic, but he was just, you know, shocked and and yeah. and, and in awe of the watch that Remco was able to push in that time trial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. agree. We won't spend much time on it, but uh, Remco did squash the the rumors. There were all the rumors flying around that he was going to uh, switch to Ineos, some mm-hmm. sort of contract buyout. But did that he addressed that, right, uh, Johan? He he did address it uh, in 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 a podcast. Uh, he did so. He said basically, he said yes. Normally, I'm staying at at Sudal Quickstep. Uh, some people were trying to read into, you know, the normally. Personally, I can say if if you think in Flemish and you translate, you know, in English, the normally is not that important. It's it's just part of the phrase. It's okay. Yeah, normally I'll stay. Yeah, you know, it's not like okay. Uh, and then and then secondly, most importantly, he said, you know, I have a contract until 2026. It's also a matter of respect. Uh, the team is making efforts. Uh, to improve, he still wants more more improvements. But uh, he says this is not fo- this is not football or soccer. You know, it's not like you can buy and 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 sell players, right? So, uh, well, why not? Of- you 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 have Johan. I mean, you bought Heras from uh, Kelme. Uh, we've seen it before. So I'm. Well, not, then we, and, and, then, count, and then and then and then we sold out. them. And then and then we sold them. <laughs> and then you sold them. <laughs> we, we sold them to Liberty. That's true. That's a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, but, I think the, the 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 what was the and maybe it wasn't public knowledge, but it was around a million dollars back then, which was fifteen years ago. I mean that it was it, would, it was would a be million, five, yeah. would be a five million dollar deal, no problem all day long. And who do yeah. we know has that money? Yeah. Well, that's the thing that you know the the doubts uh, remain a little bit uh, in terms of that Ineos. Obviously, they have lost a few good riders or let them go. We don't know. You know, Sivakov. Theo Gegenhardt, Dani Martinez, good and expensive riders, right? Uh, and they haven't added anybody really important to their roster. I think they have 15 or 16 riders under contract. I I have read that they have managed to they have managed to keep Carlos Rodriguez finally. I think that was also a little bit on hold because they may have been waiting for the whole Ramco situation. So I think it was on the table. Uh, but it's not that easy to do because it's not just Remco. There's a whole team around it. There's sponsors around it. There's teammates. There's staff. Um, so I think that that's. I, I see Remco at Zulu Quick Step next year, and and Ineos uh, just going on the way that they, they've been doing. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't see it happening honestly. All right, before we jump into Team UAE and another co-leader situation, <laughs> let's, uh, let's uh, check in real quick with a couple of our partners with some special offers. Today's show is also brought to you by AG1. And uh, I know I sound like a broken record sometimes when I talk about how these things are a part of my daily routine. They have. I found out about them from the Move podcast, just like you are. And then I'm like, you know, I should give these things a shot. And... Uh, now for over a year, AG1 has been part of my daily routine. I just take a scoop of this stuff right here. Mix is super easy. Like, I don't know if you've ever bought any supplements where it just 
clumps and it's it's hard to drink this just mixes up like you you don't even have to use a whip or anything like that you can just shake the bottle uh or or just you know just give it a quick stir with a spoon and it tastes good too by the way and it's become part of my daily routine i'm getting all those nutrients from vegetables that i'm probably not getting on my own from my uh regular diet even though my diet would surprise you guys i'm pretty good about it this has helped me up my game all right. It's helped me extensively. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then try AG1. And when you do, you get a free one year supply of vitamin D. Most people are deficient in vitamin D. And then you'll get free uh, AG1 travel packs. You'll get five of those with your order. Yes, that's five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash the move. That's drinkag1.com slash the move. Check it out. Today's show is also brought to you by eight sleep. I scored so many points with my wife when I came back from our tour coverage in Colorado with the eight sleep pod cover. It is really incredible. I had been reading about, uh, for some time about how your body just sleeps more optimally when it's at like 65 degrees. That's a really good baseline. You can adjust it from there. But I put on the pod cover. It was uh, easy to set up. It just the little connectors come out of the back, go into a small machine that you don't even see next to our bed. And it just cools it down. And you, I'm sleeping so much better. Prior to that, it was always covers off, covers on, covers off, covers on. Just couldn't get it right. And it gives you a lot of really interesting information and feedback on your sleep and your movement. And in an automatic, I have it set in auto where it auto adjusts. Uh, the temperature for what state of sleep I'm in. It really is a remarkable product. And both my wife and I are sleeping better. I promise you that. Uh, Give it a shot. If you're having trouble sleeping, doing what I was describing, covers on, covers off, covers on, covers off. This will fix that. Go to eightsleep.com slash the move and save $150 on the pod cover and stay cool this summer with eight sleep. Now shipping within the US, Canada, the UK, select countries within the EU and Australia. Again, go to eightsleep.com slash the move. And great news here for sticking with us. We are doing Ventum trivia, just like we did during the Tour de France. We're also going to be doing it on our shows during the Vuelta. This is a free chance for you to win a Ventum GS1, the brand new gravel bike. All you have to do is email in the answer to the questions, and we're going to go easier on you than we did during the tour even. Uh, but all you have to do is send in the answer. It doesn't cost you anything to enter. Just send in your answer. And each day from each show, they're going to draw a winner from that. At the end of the Vuelta, we will draw a name for a brand new Ventum GS1. Today's question, name the two riders who Johan directed to Vuelta GC wins. Two riders under the direction of Johan Bernil won the Vuelta. Who are they? Send those two names in to trivia at ventumracing.com all right again trivia at ventumracing.com send in your answer good luck all right i'll try to speed things up here i know we're, we're running a bit long but this is really interesting i'm dying to hear what you guys have to say about team uae we'll start with you george on this one uh a co-leader situation with ayuso and almeida uh but definitely all podium if not winner contenders yeah yeah, I mean, Ayuso, what an incredible talent. What, what is he, not even 20 years old or maybe 20? He's 20 um, now, yeah. 20, thir- uh, third place last year with a bit of a free card. Nobody really was probably putting that much pressure on him to podium. So I think this year he's coming in with a ton more motivation to prove that he belongs there, to prove that he is a, a future Grand Tour winner. And he's apparently on amazing form right now. He's coming in with confidence. Um, so I'm I'm excited to see how he'll... He'll perform. Grew up, the kid grew up in Atlanta, right down the street from, from me or a couple hours away, which is a really interesting story. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to see how he performs. And obviously they have Almeida as well, with third place in the Giro, has had an incredible season. So they're coming in with some really strong cards to play. And like I keep saying, this Welta, I think it's just going to be nonstop action. And uh, for me, just the uh, anticipation of seeing all these young riders, these established riders going at it head to head with hopefully no injuries, hopefully no crashes and uh, see who the, the strongest man is at the end of the, the three weeks. Yeah. Well, I mean, in terms of UA, Team UAE, you know, I, I, I can't help but think and, and sometimes see, you know, that there's two teams UAE. 
there's one team which is functioning perfectly when Pogacar is there. He's the leader. They're all around him. They function well. I've seen in the past, and especially in the Vuelta last year, uh, when Pogacar is not there, they're all over the place. They're so, I mean, they, they, sometimes they're even chasing each other. Uh, that happened in the Vuelta, that happened in the Tour of Catalonia. So I'm curious to see, uh, they're obviously two really good young riders, very ambitious, uh, how these guys are going to work together. Uh, at some point, I mean, I, I think normally uh, seeing who's starting, their mission is more or less the same as Remco. Try to stay with these top guys as long as possible, right? And and from that point of view, I think it could work that both of those guys try to hang on there as long as you can. And then one of both can maybe take advantage of some opportunity. But um, I'm curious to see that how this team will 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 function, these two guys. Um, Ayuso, I think Ayuso is really the real deal. I mean, with all, I mean, Almeida is a great rider. Okay, he's, he's up there. But uh, Ayuso is this, this, I would I would say like the 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 um, the full, like a, like a, a race like a super racehorse like the the pedigree racehorse right um, you know he was very impressive in the Tour of Switzerland almost won it and uh, and this was his main goal for the whole season um, so I'm I'm really really excited to see him race uh, at his full potential without any injury because he had this uh mysterious injury um at the beginning of the season and finally they could sort it out but uh yeah he's um he's gonna be up there as far as co-leaders will that stage three finish be a deciding factor <laughs> they should both be there uh they may both lose some time they're probably gonna lose some time a little bit um but it's not a deciding factor yet mm. of uh, and, too and, early and and you know what? If you're not really the leader to be having a real shot at winning the race, it may actually be better that there is no real leader in the team and that both guys go and, and then they can find themselves, you know, on, on the climbs and, and say, okay, you know, I feel a little bit better. But it's not necessarily always a disadvantage that there's a designated leader because you can have a designated leader and then he finishes fifth or sixth. Okay, it's great for the guy, but it's not really what a team like UAE is looking for, right? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think where they're in a strong position and a lot of these climbs, that's the one, I feel like the one unique thing about the Welta is it's a lot of big roads. I mean, positioning isn't a massive factor. So a lot of it is just like, how fast can you go up this climb? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, it, it'll be interesting to see who can hang on the longest or who will be the strongest. But a lot of this positioning stuff that happens in the Giro and the Tour is not a real factor during the Welta. All right, now let's move on to Eneos. And then we, as we learned in the, the Giro this year, you never rule out Garrett Thomas. Uh, yeah, the, that, old G, the, the old G, the diesel engine, he's got the most experience out of anybody. Um, he probably knows his body, his body better than anybody. He's got the confidence of coming in second place at the Giro. Um, yeah, I'm excited to see what he'll do in this, in this Vuelta for sure. He's got a great team behind him as well. He looks really motivated also, uh, George, you know, I mean, he, it was at his, at his request to go to this Giro. Uh, interesting fact also, Egan Bernal with, together with, uh, with Geraint Thomas, which I think is great news for Ineos and for Bernal himself to do two grand tours. I mean, we, we all saw how much. Bernal worked and how much he suffered in the Tour de France, but the fact that he's there, obviously also it's not an obligation for him to race. He has asked to race the, the, the Vuelta. So that means that Bernal is on his way back to, you know, hopefully uh, his, his former level. Yeah, I agree. I'm excited to see um, how far Bernal, how, how good Bernal does in this Vuelta and um, how he's recovered from the, the Tour de France, and hopefully he can, like we said, Johan, regain, regain his his normal pre-accident fitness. Yeah. All right. Now, I think we've that really covers the the major favorites, but there's a few other wild cards out there. Maybe we'll we'll start with you on that, Johan. Who else uh, could you see as a podium contender? There's, I mean, there's still Enric Mas. There's Miguel Landa, uh, Vlasov. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I mean. 
Yes, yes and no. Uh, they are, we name them because they have done some stuff in the past, but let's be, let's be honest. I, I don't see anybody of those guys really have a shot at winning the Vuelta. Enric Mas has finished three times second in the Vuelta. We don't know his condition right now. He, you know, he crashed out on day one in the Tour de France. Um, and then the other guys, you know, like Vlasov, yeah, okay, but it's, you know, never, he's never been close to winning a Grand Tour. Um, so I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I think, I think personally, it's it's Roglic, Vingegaard, Remco, and 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 Geraint Thomas. There's, you know, those are all those are all Grand Tour winners. Uh, you could say Bernal, but Bernal is, I mean, it's a grand, multiple Grand Tour winner, but we all know his situation. The other guys, though, I don't think it would be realistic that they could be on the podium, but ha having a shot at winning something would, I mean, all of these other guys would have to fail altogether. And that's not going to happen. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think these guys are top five, you know, top six, seven candidates. Uh, some good stage win candidates. Uh, if if the, the, the top favorites are watching themselves and they kind of sneak away with, 5K to go on a climb. They're still going to add to the excitement of the race, no doubt. I mean, even guys like Jay Vine on UAE who won two stages last year came from riding Zwift, which is an incredible story. Um, so there's still, even even beyond those top favorites, there's going to be a lot of exciting racing, racing going on in the Welta. And then real quick, although we've already said it, this, this, you know, a lot of the big name sprinters are passed when the, on this course. It did not suit them. Uh, but what are going to be the names to to, to watch for the sprints? Uh, and how many sprints do you think there will be, Johan? It's difficult to say. It's difficult to say. Um, I, th I mean, one of the biggest names, in my opinion, is Caden Groves. Um, you have Brian Pocar, uh, Molano, who won the last stage last year in the in the Vuelta. Actually, yeah, he did. He did win the last stage in the Vuelta last year. Uh, but you know the big sprinters are not there. Do I, am I forgetting somebody um, like a, a big a big sprinter? Uh, I, let's say it's Absolutely. it's it's guys who are fast, but not the, your top five sprinters. You know, I think we've seen those guys in the Giro and in the Tour. Um, yeah. So it's going to be interesting. I mean, these guys have chances. Uh, you know, there's this there's this Dutch guy who I really like, who's fast. This uh, Van den Berg, who's on EF. You know, he's a fast rider. Uh, great opportunity for those guys to take their, you know, a grand grand tour stage. Um, but you know, I mean, a guy like Caden Gross, for example, I think he's one of the one of the biggest names in the sprint, and the team he has around him probably also has that goal to work for him. Uh, but other than that, I think it's a lottery. It's a lottery really for the sprinters and. Uh, Knowing that these big sprinters are not there gives, of course, more motivation for guys to try to go in breakaways and attack and, and try to win from breakaways, which I think we could see more often in this Giro, in this Vuelta. Yeah, I agree with you, Johan. I think it's going to be uh, the, the, the Welter is short stages. They're fast, um, exciting, jam-packed racing, and we're going to probably see some new, new sprinter names coming up uh, throughout the Welter. All right, pick your overall winner, and then I'll let you guys go. I'm saying Primoz Roglic. Yeah, yeah, I'm going. I'm going with Roglic too. I'm going with Roglic. Um, um, I'm going to go with Roglic, Remco, and uh, um, Almedia. Really? That's mm -hmm. your podium. Do you want yeah. to fill out your podium, Johan? I, I I personally think Roglic and Vingegaard go one two. And third. Ramco. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you very much. George, Johan, I appreciate your time. Great insight. And uh, we'll do, we'll have a sort of a rotating um, uh, bit of commentary as we go through this Vuelta. Uh, but we'll be checking in midweek and then weekends throughout the, the Vuelta. So, yeah. Anyhow. And, and also, also with La Movida. This, the same show preview we have tomorrow for La Movida. And then one midweek and one weekend show um, every week for okay. La Movida also. Same as the move. All right. And Th daily, daily predictions of our outcomes, not forget. Daily. You and Spencer yes. are doing daily on outcomes. Daily. All right. Yes. Yeah. And you can get outcomes. You can get that show by going to wedo.team, getting the season pass. And it comes to your mobile device, just like any podcast would. 
It's usually about 15, 20 minutes and uh, really good insight from Johan and Spencer on outcomes. Guys, yep, thank and, you. Uh, Yo- 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 I'll see you in a few weeks in Mallorca. We actually sold out that camp. So if any of you guys are missed Mallorca camp, we got, I think, Strada Bianca next, next end Strada, of March. Strada Bianca, okay. uh, Flanders, Tour of Flanders, and Paris Dobe. Every time, every, every time, three day events. I'm actually in Mallorca now, George. So I went to, you know, check out some, uh, some, uh, some things at, uh, at where we stay. And I, I talked with some people. We have a new guide who, who you will like. Uh, one of the, one of the new guides who you will like, you know him very well. Okay. So okay. I'll, I'll fill you in on that. But, um, but yeah, um, excited to see you in a one month live again with, with yeah. Lance and Jan Ulrich. Um, and yeah, those who are interested, uh, check out, uh, the travel section on our, on our site, we do dot team. And, uh, we have other options for the spring. Yep. Excellent guys. Thank you. Thank you guys. Okay. Bye-bye.